The Red Fort in Delhi is one of the most beautiful and famous buildings in the world. This was commissioned by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, who was believed to be the richest man of his time. He spared no expense or effort while he built this. This was conceived as a dazzling gem studded in a beautiful ring called Shah Jahabad, the new city he settled. Ever since, this has become the symbol of India. Famous as Kila e Mubarak, the Red Fort was a small, dazzling city within a city, replete with beautiful mosques, palaces, and pavilions. It bore testimony to the immense riches of India at that time. What we see today is less than one fourth of the edifices erected by Shah Jahan and his successors. Shah Jahanabad was effectively Shah Jahan's great new city. It was bringing the Mughal Empire back to Delhi and creating not just a fort but a city a city within a city and beyond. And it is evidence of a grand urban design of the Mughals in India. Its morphology is so clear of dream of an emperor to build a new city. And this, of course, was true historically of Delhi. Every emperor built a new city. But Shah Jahan is perhaps the best survivor. During the reign of Emperor Shah Jahan, the Red Fort was akin to the jewel in the crown of the imperial capital. Shah Jahan's successor, Aurangzeb, spent most of his life in the Deccan. He didn't attach any significance to the Red Fort. Mughal princes who followed him on the throne proved to be weaklings. Neither Shah Alam nor Faraksir had the resources or the will to maintain the glory of the Red Fort. The difference between the Red Fort and the earlier Mughal forts, whether you look at Agra, whether you look at Lahore, whether you look at Allahabad, was that these earlier forts were, they were built up over time. So they were amalgamations of acts of patronage of different rulers. The Red Fort is the only one that was built, conceived as an entity at one time and together with a city, with an entirely new city, you know, which is an enormous feat. Strong walls and gates were built to protect the fort. moat was dug on three sides, running along the ramparts. The river Yamuna served the same purpose on the fourth side. Even military fortifications appear to add a cosmetic charm to the citadel. The influence of the Agra fort is discernible everywhere. अकबर का बनाया हुआ जो आगरे का किला है उसमें भी एक खौफ और एक आदमी के ऊपर एक रौब तारी होता है जब आगरे के किले में दाखिल होता है लेकिन जब हम लाल किले में दाखिल होते हैं तो वो खौफ वो एग्रेसिवनेस या जैसे कोई ऐसे माहौल में हम जा रहे हैं जहाँ कोई प्रेशर हमारे जहन पर डाल रहा है शाहजहाँ के यहाँ जो कल्चर था जो एस्थेटिक सेंस था वो लाल किले से जाहिर होता है To the south is the Delhi Gate. A circular path leading from the outer gate passes through this to lead us in. 
This entrance is decorated with fine stone carvings. A tall tower protects it. The Lahori Gate stands right in the middle of the wall on the western side. It opens to Channi Chok, the heart of the city. Old paintings tell us how the city bustled with life in days gone by. When Aurangzeb usurped the throne from his father, he erected a small tower in front of this gate to fortify it further. Aurangzeb added a barbican, which is a double gate, described then by Shah Jahan as, as putting a veil across the face of a woman because his gate was so splendiferous to create a barbican in front of it was for him closing the whole linkage he had that had been conceived of this gate as the main entrance facing Chandni Chok, so that was lost. The Diwani Arm is a pillared pavilion open on three sides where the Mughal emperors gave audience to their subjects. The throne for the emperor was placed on a platform about 10 feet high. The inlay work above the throne suggests clearly that European artists were also involved. Gems and precious stones were used for the inlay work on the walls. Animals and birds, as well as flowers, strove to replicate the natural colors of the original objects. These paintings revive memories of happier times. It is ironical that the man who built this beautiful fort was not destined or allowed to spend his days in comfort and peace here in his favorite residence. His own son Aurangzeb imprisoned him and dispatched him off to Agra where he spent his last days in the namesake of this fort, the Red Fort of Agra. Aurangzeb himself was so busy with his Deccan campaign that he had little time to spend here in the Red Fort in Delhi. His successors were puny, not comparable to their illustrious ancestors. They were not interested in statecraft, but were debauches who indulged in art, literature, music, dance, revelry. Those were the days when the fort became more accessible to the common man and the Red Fort of Delhi became an integral part of their lives. The Diwane Khas is the place where the sovereigns met their ministers and nobles. This was where the throne, made of solid gold, Takhte Taus, was placed. Nadir Shah, the Afghan invader, took it away as booty of war. Old paintings testify that the walls were gilded in gold and precious stones were used for the decorative inlay work. Extraordinary proportion of colonnade and arches with the emperor's takht at the far end. Wonderfully painted, inlaid, gilded and painted. So it, it's a combination of all the high art The dazzling beauty of the Divani Khas is mentioned in travelogues of many foreign visitors.
it is mentioned that the ceiling was covered with silver. When spendthrift princes had squandered away the treasury, they were constrained to dismantle it to sell the silver. It is the most important piece of urban palace architecture anywhere in the world. Therefore, it has a preeminent place as uh, a fort and a palace in India and anywhere else from the medieval times onwards. It also has several lessons today in terms of how we can plan our cities, our residences, gardens, art objects, a whole range of things. The Khas Mahal is a very beautiful building. The scales of justice are depicted on the wall to project the image of the ruler as an impartial judge. An impressive exhibition of inlay work is on display here. They drew in craftsmen from all over India, so you get this Indian craftsman in an Islamic building and it's a mesh of Persian, Indian, Kashmiri, Rajasthani, Gujarati art all coming together to create Mughal art. And that effectively I think was its greatness, is, is it was the fusion of, of their recognition of great art from all over. It came together so faultlessly. Residential apartments for the ruler and other members of the royal family were located here. Delicately carved stone screens served as curtains. The palace not only contained the Khwabga, but also a number of small and large sitting rooms. The city of Shah Jahanabad, in Stephen Blake's phrase, was Mughal Empire in miniature form. Uh, so if you look at it, you can uh, see how uh, the emperor would have liked his empire to be and how he would have liked it to run. Ruling over the empire can be quite tiresome. Provision was made for recreation and entertainment. This was arranged in the Rang Mahal. The Nehre Bahisht, running right through the middle, kept the residential apartments naturally cool. It's just a profusion of pleasure palaces. So you could see, and the linkage between the Zanana palaces and the king's palaces is, is through this, linked with the Nehre Bisht, which is a grand scheme of water flowing through the palaces all along the waterfront, so at all times of the year. The water supply in the fort was efficiently managed through the Nehre Bahisht. It is through this canal that the Yamuna water entered the fort at Shahburj and moved along creating a number of miniature waterfalls along the way. The stream not only cooled the buildings, but also added to the aesthetics of the overall ambience. Here on the walls of Divan e Khas, some very poignant lines are inscribed. In Persian, it is written, Agar Firdos Bar Rue, 
जमी अस्त हो हमी अस्त हमी अस्त हमी अस्त इफ देयर बी पैराडाइज ऑन अर्थ इट इज़ हेयर इट इज़ हेयर इट इज़ हेयर इट इज़ ट्रेजिक द दिस रेड फोर्ट हैज़ इन्जॉयड द प्लेजर्स ऑफ पैराडाइज एंड ऑल्सो सफर्ड द फ्यूरीज एंड पेंस ऑफ हेल दिस इज़ द प्लेस वेयर मुगल एम्प्रेयर्स रेंड इन पॉम्प एंड ग्लोरी एंड दिस इज़ वेयर इन डिफीट द फोर्ट वॉज रेवेज दिस इज़ द प्लेस वेयर नादिर शाह केम टूक अवे द पी कॉक थ्रोन एंड द फेमस कोहनूर एंड लेफ्ट दिस प्लेस इन रूइंस इट इज़ ऑल्सो सेड दिट इज वॉज नॉट ऑलवेज द इन्वेडर्स हु रैक्ड एंड रूइन द बिल्डिंग इट वॉज ऑल्सो मुगल एम्पर्स एंड देयर डिसेंडेंट्स फॉलन इन पॉपरी हु पिलेज द रिच इज हियर like his ancestors from central asia shah jahan was very fond of water the hammams in the mughal palaces served not merely as bathrooms they provided space for the royal family to play with water luxurious bathing areas or the hammams that have very interesting water systems of how the hot vapors were generated through water channels and then the entire system of how it was used there is a dressing room on the uh, on another side and all these spaces have very interesting inlay work in semi precious stone The hammam has large hall-like rooms and stone tubs and platforms. The hammam cast in the mold of a palace tells us a lot about the aesthetic sensibility of the man who conceived and built it. what the red fort exemplifies is this courtyard typology where internal space and external space are very well meshed they're very well integrated so in a sense you can't even say that you know this is where my outside space is ending and this is where my internal space is beginning <laughs> The beautiful Moti Masjid was constructed by Aurangzeb. The interesting thing is that Aurangzeb, who didn't agree with almost all that his father did, has used white marble so beloved of his father in this building. The minarets of the mosque are slim and delicate and the dome is also not very large. Not all the buildings that we see in the red fort today were built by the Mughals. Many like these barracks were erected by the British after 1857. 1857 was when the spark was ignited. of the freedom struggle in india bahadur shah zafar the last mughal emperor then residing in red fort took over the command of the mutineers for this he was punished by the british when they restored order he was banished to burma and zafar penned the poignant lines kitna hai bad naseeb zafar dafn ke liye doga zameen bhi namidi kuye yaar mein he was indeed denied a small stretch of land in his motherland for his burial and had to rest in far off foreign country Red Fort ever since became a powerful source of inspiration for all the freedom fighters. The country was shaken up by an upheaval that engulfed this land in 1857. The battle cry of the Great Revolt was first sounded here in the Red Fort. After great tumult the British occupied the fort and in the blink of an eye the royal palace was transformed into a soldier's garrison
when the British made the shift from being glorified traders to empire builders that they occupied the bread fort in Delhi. It was a statement of power. They were the next emperors. And that caused a lot of destruction. They destroyed the char bags. They destroyed much of the fort. Perhaps one is most offended at the Delhi fort where buildings of such beauty and gardens of such perfection were so destroyed. The British didn't care in the least how the fort was being damaged by their occupation. Ugly structures were raised to house the large number of soldiers. Mughals, although they came from outside, finally became Indians. They were not sending uh, revenues and monies and wealth outside India. They settled down in the real India of plurality, of diversity, of many religions, of many languages, of many art practices. And they all felt at home with that. That is one big thing which the British could not. I mean, our problem with the British was that the British were not Indians, but Mughals were Indian. This painting depicts the enchanting visage of the Red Fort that once held the visitors spellbound when it was built. The British army plundered it ruthlessly just to terrify people so that no one would dare to challenge their might in the future. There was widespread looting. First, it was just as, you know, by bands of soldiers, and then later it was as an organized activity where the crown actually listed the movable assets of the fort, which included the gilded copper domes of the Musamman Burj, the Moti Masjid, the precious stones that were inlaid in the Diwane Khas, in the Khas Mahal, uh, in the Diwane Yam, uh, in the Emperor's throne. So all those were taken out and were, you know, as a part of an organized activity. But the order for the destruction of the parts, the structures of the fort, that was actually implemented in 1860. So it took three years, which means that it was a premeditated act. It was not something that was just, just happened. It is not only the British who scarred this fort. Encroachment, illegal occupation, disfigurement and damage have continued after independence. The Red Fort has inspired poets and artists for generations. Memories of Ghalib, Zok and Bahadur Shah Zafar are entwined with it. This isn't a landmark, but it is an embodiment of independent India's identity. It is our duty to preserve this priceless heritage for future generations. <laughs>